said when we asked to slow the aeroplane down. He gave a very good scenario why we wanted to do it, so there's good relevance for it. But what was the first comment that he made? Sorry? Yeah, I'm going to change the power. Now, let's think about our student. Our student is coming from a two-dimensional environment in most cases. They're driving cars all their life. What's their speed control in the car? Power, isn't it? So if the first thing we say when we introduce straight and level is I'm going to slow the plane down, so I'm going to reduce the power to 4,400, what's the direct correlation that we've introduced immediately for that student? Is that what we want? So we all acknowledge the more complex issue of power, and power plus attitude equals performance, but in the delivery of it, we've almost set ourselves up to fail to start with. So, this, and this, I mean, everything that was done with this demonstration was correct. And I, would that be a fairly similar way that most people would demonstrate straight level at various airspeeds? It would be fairly similar. And I've seen a lot of them. I mean, I, I know we get variations. But great scenario recognition, why we need to do it. This is the process. There was a lot of talk back to attitude on the horizon. But the first thing was introduced was power. Okay. I'm now going to have a look at uh, how we just went through this and delivered it. And... Uh, this instructor, or CFI, was extremely across it and very competent CFI. But we'll just have a look at something that uh, we've explored and I've done with a few of you in the room as well. Okay, so, Mr. Chief, what we want to do is we want to slow the aeroplane down, but we want to maintain the flight below our current height. It's about 1,700 feet, and we're doing about 65 knots. You'll see that's reference weight attitude that we pull in the final with flight. If I want to slow the aeroplane down, I need to do a combination of two things. I need to change my attitude to change my airspeed, but I also need to make a power change, otherwise we won't fly at all. Okay? So hand on the what I'll do is I'm going to raise the nose to reduce the airspeed and reduce the power. Same time. Now the sequence we do it in, some will argue you reduce power first, but clearly we want to make sure that there's reference to attitude for airspeed. What did you say, 3-8? Something like that? Yeah, it's a 3-8. Good heavy, so we'll... Now, so you can see we've raised the nose, we've slowed down. We've now got an airspeed of 50 knots, about 4,000 of a flying level. Notice that the controls feel a little bit sloppy at that bar of airspeed, and we will trim it as required, but I'm just demonstrating the exercise. So it'll be an attitude power trip or power attitude trip. Yep. Now, what I did was I precursed it by the attitude reference to airspeed, yep. and I, but I referenced straight away reference it to a combination of power and attitude. Yep. So rather than just chat saying, I'll reduce the power, which leads the student to think that power is my speed control, I've correlated the two together. So I've been true to privacy, but I've brought the two in together. Yep. You know what I mean? So if I want to speed up, clearly I have to adjust both. I'm going to lower the nose and their power. Again, what combination we do it in, it depends on the aircraft. Yep. But lowering the nose, bringing the aircraft power, we know that this is the most accurate instrument in the aircraft. So we can set a power setting 4.8, hold our attitude. Of course, if that plane takes a little while to stabilise, and then we re the aircraft. Yep. But in a straight level exercise, in a quantity setting exercise, not doing that late, 
If you're in the circuit, and you've got to slow yes. down and maintain your height, you've got to pull it down first. Yes, exactly. Otherwise, you're going high as well. Yeah, my reference is specifically there too. That's why I said. Yeah, by the way. But, right. uh, yeah, so that, yeah. that's just something. And the other thing I do, I get GA guys that are always using the throttle for ESP. So what I do, what height do we climb to here? We're, we're, we're going to hop, what's our height? Ah, oh, that's right, okay. So we'll just put the aircraft in a full power pilot, so we'll have a look out. So power, attitude, trip, balancing with rudder. So here we are in climb, we're climbing at 65 knots. Using the throttle, how do we adjust the airspeed of the aeroplane? Well, if you keep the attitude there, no, I'm just using the throttle. Ah, well, we can't get on that. Okay, good. So we can't use the throttle to change your airspeed in the climbing configuration. All right, we're now going to put the aircraft into a right descent. Attitude, power, trim. RBD. We should get the So now using the throttle, I want you to use the throttle to slow the aeroplane down. Can we do that? So at a glide or at a climb, we can't use the throttle to control the airspeed. But in either scenario, we can use the attitude of the aeroplane to have a direct, if not lagged, effect on the airspeed. Pitching up causes us to slow down, lowering the nose causes us to speed up. Okay, so look, that was just a real live video. That was a real CFI review, and that was just a bit of an explanation. I found it's useful. Who, who, who thinks that the, the, the extent demonstration of showing it at, at climb or descent reinforces that attitude is our SB control? Good. Okay, I think we've got a consensus, but I can tell you that even in this room and, and as I travel around the country, we, are, we do definitely see quite a diversion away from it. And, and it's becoming more and more prominent when we have more and more GA instructors infiltrating into RAOs. Now, as I keep saying, it's not a bad thing. It's just that we need to reference with a low inertial aircraft, the primacy of attitude for airspeed becomes more relevant. Whether you practice a large combination of glide approaches or whether you do powered approaches for three degree in a high performance aircraft, and the sequence of how you change it to maintain that plus or minus 50 feet in terms of reducing power first is not the question here. But the question here is, are we teaching and do, how do we effectively teach the right primacies? Now this is lesson what? Two or three if we've done a trial flight. So in lesson one, we've just talked about the elevator controlling attitude and thereby a further effect has an effect on airspeed. So if we turn around in lesson two and say we're going to reduce or increase our speed using power, have we sent a completely contrary message to the student at lesson three or two? Is it any wonder we have stall spin and stall related accidents at low height when it becomes an emergency situation and they revert back to that privacy that may or may not have been glued correctly? Something to think about. So look, thanks for that. Look out. I just want to go back to Matt's slide. focus over the nose of the aircraft during the turning part of the exercise. Great. A few hands down, which is okay, it doesn't mean, it just means that you were probably taught a different way. If we look inside the turn, while we we're conducting the turn, where are we ascertaining our primary reference information of attitude for airspeed, angle for, to horizon for roll, and also balance by movement across the horizon? If we're looking inside the turn, how are we determining those three key elements of maintaining a balanced turn? 
Matt just said it. He looked at the target. He focused on the target because he was in a competitive environment and he broke his own golden rule. Now, we saw the consequences of that at, at Zot Feet. Now, the consequences at 1,000 feet or 2,000 feet or flying around the sky doing a nav or wherever we go are probably nothing more than a bit of height loss outside parameters, parameters and a plane that's not being flown well in balance. So is it going to kill anybody at 3,000 feet? Probably not. Let's go to the next scenario. Engine failure, a real one. Pilot comes in, he's got issues to deal with, he's got a passenger that's freaking out, there's a lot of workload in the cockpit, and he's target fixating on, a, on, a, on an area that he hasn't worked out that's big enough to land in, and he's still trying to assess whether it's suitable, and he's target fixated. Where would he be target fixated? On the paddock. So who's looking out over the front porch? Who's managing the key variables, the AVA part of this equation, while they're in this high stress, high workload scenario? How many people know of a pilot who's had a stall, spin, incipient collision with terrain as a result of a, a, an extension of an emergency? I know of three that have died. I think we all, if we look back through our memoirs, we know of a few. This primacy of teaching turning referencing is a basic element. It's lesson four, lesson five. And, and I often see a lot of our students looking inside the turn, particularly on base to final, when we start pushing circuit referencing, we start again. It's, a, it's almost the, the inverse to the instrument, looking at the airspeed indicator for airspeed. We're trying to get them to fly a rectangular pattern around a circuit. They know what the outcome is. It's that point on the runway where the piano keys are, and that's where they look. And that's where they drag their eyes. And when you try to drag a plane to a point that's outside of reference, what's the most effective control to make the plane actually move the nose there? The rudder. If I want the nose to yaw to look to see that picture, because that's where I want my nose of my plane to be, because that's where I need to be. And what's the danger of the rudder in the turn? I knew a pilot once who overbanked and held off bank in a turn. The old tiger moth head. Skidding turn. Now, I often ask the question, a bit of a poll, which is the most dangerous unbalanced turn in an aircraft? A skidding turn or a slipping turn? So hands for skidding, hands for the slipping turn. People who only ever fly in balance. So which, just think about which is the most dangerous turn. Has anyone seen the Turn Smart video? Has anyone ever seen that video? We're going to try and get permission to load that up. It's a public video. You can go and have a look at it too. Go and have a look at Turn Smart. If you haven't seen it, I've talked to it with a number of CFIs on, on visits. Turn Smart video. I won't answer that question. I'll leave that one to you guys to go and have a look at it. Um, the top rudder turn is an important tool, and any ag pilot will tell you about top rudder turning and procedural turning and keyway turns and why they do them the way they do. But to have a look at it. Uh, the other one, uh, I had one the other day. Um, what's our primary reference for balance? Talking about turns, what's your primary reference for balance? Any thoughts? So the balance ball. Any more, Doug? Okay, we'll get a microphone. Sorry, Doug. I 100% disagree. It's definitely not the balance ball. That's not our primary cue for balance. Our primary cue for balance is our, is our muscles in our lower back. That's going to tell us firstly, initially, whether we're balanced or not. Our secondary reference is the balance ball. Any, anybody else want to add to that? Any other thoughts? What do you teach for balance? Oh, look out the front window. The ball? Look out, who, who said look out the front window? Look out the front. Okay. What are we using for primary reference for every other control, primary control? Uh, the horizon. Do you not believe that you can use the horizon as the primary reference for balance? Who's a glider pilot here in the room? We've got a few. What's the problem? Where do you look for balance? Your string, yeah. Why do we put your string on the horizon? Or pretty much in that point, the horizon. So when we, when we actually talk about your as a, pri as a, as a primary control, and uh, something mentioned about the underuse of rudder, I think we'll all agree that we've got a lot of work cut out sometimes to, to get that third control in our feet working. The horizon is still the primary reference for balance. 
Now, you need to build a repertoire for it, and Doug's absolutely right. You'll certainly feel it, and commercial pilots get hammered big time about balance because when they're carrying passengers, if you're out of balance and they're in row four, they're going to end up with a very sick passenger very quickly. So that's very much part of the commercial license and test standards, and might probably attest to that. But the horizon, the same thing, we, which we don't want to trade commodities when we teach. If we're using horizon as our primary reference, understand that there is a way to teach balance through the horizon. When you show adverse yaw as part of your demonstration, and do we do adverse yaw in turning, pre-turning, or do we do it as part of some other lesson? When we teach adverse yaw, one of the things you can do is put a hand at your reference or the student's parallax reference point to demonstrate adverse yaw. A good way to do it is the slower airspeed, so you actually exacerbate the adverse yaw effect to the ailer of the downward going ailer. But if you put a reference out to a finite point on the horizon and you put your hand up there, the student will clearly see the, the nose of the aircraft yawing in the opposite direction to the turn. And again, we're using that, going back to PMI, we're using that visual referencing, showing the student with his eyes, the old seeing is believing concept. If I can show you through a reference on the, on the dash that the aircraft's nose is, is yawing the opposite the way we need, I've just done my job. Now having done that, we can then extend on that so that when a balance turn, we can show that the nose of the aircraft for any angle of bank will move around the horizon and a, a concept I pattern is say, now we understand that we have to use rudder and sometimes we might start with rudder in some of our low performance or specific aircraft, we might lead with rudder as we say, other aircraft will balance with rudder. But we paint a line around the top of the fence, the top of the fence being the horizon. And we fly that line and we paint that, that line using balance. The steeper the bank angle, the faster we paint across. The slower the bank angle, the slower we paint across. If we stop moving the brush, are we slipping or skidding? If the nose of the aircraft is not moving around the horizon and you're in a, in a, in a banked configuration, is the aircraft slipping or skidding? Slipping, thank you. If it's, if it's rolling around the horizon really fast and the nose is pitching down, further effect of rudder, we are? Great. So if we use this as a horizon reference, we teach that the porch, the nose of the aircraft, and looking at that horizon as our primary reference, we've got all the tools in our toolbox to create the true VFR pilot and a well-balanced stick and rudder pilot. But if we use the ball as the primary reference, we're starting that delineation and that mitigation back down to instruments as being a primary reference. Okay, good. Any comments? Doug? I just did a quick one. I think we use. Just a quick one, yeah. On all of our training aircraft, we have like. Instead of using that visual hand for the parallel, the parallel line, we have our attitude reference points, so we can reference that to the student for the attitude or in a turn when we're rolling around that point, so we've found that pretty effective for, for our operation. Yeah, and the reference with you, and a lot of people, sorry Trevor, down the front, a lot of people use it, we'll just get your mic, so, uh, a lot of people use a, a fixed reference like a piece of tape or a, or a pencil mark. Just supporting more of what uh, Neil has said there. I actually have a difficulty within my own training where I forget the ball and I'll be well into a student's flying and such like and I say to them, oh your ball's out a little bit, fix it up and I realise I forgot all about teaching them the ball because I've been teaching them the outside reference, looking at the speed of the horizon around the sky, the nose reference points and uh, because they do it so well, I forget that little component of the ball. So I reinforce what you're saying there very strongly. What you're saying, I guess, is it works so well that you don't even need the instrument. <laughs> there you go. John. Yeah, you know, whilst, whilst I don't disagree, I think everyone's got a different way of teaching, but you said yourself you started your career as a glider pilot. When you were a glider pilot, what did you use as your primary turn and balance reference? The nose of the aircraft. And the string just happens to be and the string. And Let's face it, all you're doing in that ball is that string. And the problem with the string is it works opposite to the ball. Um, and I, it, exactly, it does, but you learn that as a glider. And I must say, gliding, I still believe that gliding is a lot to teach us. And, but at that early stage, we already know the difficulty we have getting students to even recognise the horizon attitude 
you try and start bringing in that turn slip at that early stage, and I think you've lost. Yep. I agree. Yeah, look, I'll, I tend to use the balance ball fairly regularly in the aircraft that we use, which is a Technan Golf, and it has a bit of an idiosyncrasy where it requires a helmet on the right rudder to keep the balance ball centered and climb with full power. So, and the easiest way to uh, to keep the aircraft balanced is to look at the balance ball uh, because the nose is already high on the horizon, on the horizon. So. Um, that's the best way I can think of, of keeping the aircraft balanced uh, in the climb. I, I totally agree, and thanks. It's good to hear some counter argument. I, I want to hear counter argument because in the room we want to share these ideas. And there are certain phases of flight where the balance ball is really uh, um, in, in, prime, in, a, in a climb, for example, where the balance is due to a slipstream effect. That's a classic. That's where you do need to use because you can't always see a reference in front of you on the horizon. So uh, runway alignment, much seeing, I see in my airfield, I watch, it's a very busy training airfield, and I watch aircraft constantly taking off, and I look at aircraft climbing out on runway heading, well, you'd like to think I'm on my heading, but even if, without a crosswind, I see aircraft darting off, you know, 200 metres left, and they're training operations. That aeroplane is just flying in, doing circuit after circuit, and probably 50 metres, 200 metres off to the left of the runway. So uh, that's the case, yeah. Sorry, Andy. Yes. I go along with what John says. You try to teach it something that takes you years to develop. If you just look at the ball, you can see an instant, and eventually you'll start to develop what you're talking about, that feeling of the seat of your pants flying. So I think it's a lot easier to teach a student, <coughs> what, I, what I do is you use your own one for, for turning the aeroplane, you should feed your balance in it. Uh, we'll go to Colin, thank you. Yeah, just so we're starting to talk about instructing technique here. I mean, we've all got these little tools we can use. Uh, I agree with what I said earlier, a new student, if you've got a switch on student, you can start introducing skidding and slipping at that early stage. But much better I use is someone who's not really that switched on, they just push the bloody rudder pedal out of balance and say, can you feel that? Uh, just, just a practical example. So you can use all these tricks, but at the end of the day, you've got to adapt it to each student. Yeah, good. And what are you talking about? Tricks of the train. Uh, Mike. I agree with the last three speakers. I found that um, uh, the ball, particularly on climb out, particularly on high power, your is a critical factor, uh, dynamic yaw of the airplane due to the thrust. The other thing I find is that if I just tell them to look at attitude, but scan the instruments for God's sake, right at the beginning, and the ball tells me if the aircraft is balanced and we're flying properly. And I say, don't concentrate on that. Now relate that to your airspeed and your attitude out the front. In other words, keep scanning instruments. And the ball, to me, is a critical factor in keeping the damn thing straight and uh, balanced. Thanks, Michael. We might end on the ball and kick that one to the curb for now. Um, but some good discussion. Thanks very much for everyone for your input. Consistency of terms is the next thing I want to talk about. Um, Oftentimes we see, uh, it's very easy to get comfortable and we all get comfortable after thousands of hours of instructing and we develop our own style which is great and, and, and style helps flow and creates a good working relationship. But prime, um, keeping true to terms, there's a lot of nose goes and nose drops and stuff like that and we've all been guilty of it. Um, in fact, did anyone pick up in the slide? in the presentation, if the, the more people listening, I actually deliberately inserted a reverse reference and said the nose, uh, I use the nose, goes down or something. I just put it in there. I wanted to see if someone picked it up. But we all do it. And uh, it's important to stay true to terms. So we talk about the three axes, as pitch, roll and yaw, and we want to make sure we replicate those in all of our discussion in the cockpit, in any pattern that we use. Um, a lot of our talking going on here, but I actually, just give you a quick story, I went and did a CFI assessment uh, last year and great guy, great flight, very experienced and we would had a lot of talk before we got in the cockpit. By the time we climbed out on upwind leg, I think we are about 400 feet and we all know what it's like, the audible context, you've got a loud audio in your ear and just imagine you're a student hearing it that way for the first or second time. My head was drumming, probably like yours is right now. 
my head was drumming. It was like I there was so much talk. There was a wealth being, of knowledge being spewed out about what I needed to do, and I was just in a climbing phase of flight. I got to the crosswind turn, and I actually looked at the instructor, and I said, "I want you to try something for me. I want you to pattern me the rest of the circuit in less than 20 words." Well. I think we were mid downwind before he'd actually opened his mouth. Because <laughs> there was a lot of thinking going on. <laughs> and it was very difficult. This instructor was so used to talking, and I, I call it show and tell. There was so much talking. And it was none of it was bad, none of it was wrong. But there was so much audible coming in my ear. And it was in early in the morning, it wasn't like it was late in the day. <laughs> um, it was overwhelming. And I was learning nothing. And I just put myself in a student's shoes and I just thought, man. Uh, and I think it sort of verifies some of the comments that were made just in relation to the ball. There is a time and a place for everything. Uh, we got to mid downwind and the, the poor bloke was struggling. He, he really did not have in his toolbox any tricks to be able to fly a circuit with using limited words. So we demonstrated it, we went through it, and he was in disbelief. He was a doubting Thomas. You can't teach a circuit and show somebody how to fly a circuit accurately within 20 words. I said, we'll start counting. I think we got to 21, and we touched the piano keys. So maybe if we had to finish it, it would have gone to 30. But yeah, it's uh, interesting if you think about how you can use nonverbal techniques to teach, because again, it's the nonverbal that the student actually probably takes most of, not the verb. Be the Marcel, Marcel in the cockpit. And to finish that off, pattern should be a caption, not the story. We fly and instruct a cartoon and the caption just basically crystallises the picture. And what you focus on, and this goes back to the instruments, what you focus on as an instructor is what will create the legacy for that pilot. And we see this. Uh, I can fly with students, and I said, you were taught by so-and-so, weren't you? And they say, how did you know that? And I go, no, I just know. And we've all had um, uh, people that grace our, our, our flight schools, that they turn up and we know certain styles around the neighbourhood or whatever, and we can, we can sense it. And that can be a good thing. All, we all bring good things to the party. And uh, I, that's why we encourage pilots to go and do biannual flight reviews with different examiners, because you'll learn something from everybody differently. What you learn first lasts longest, nothing new there. We revert to primacy under stress, and I think I covered that in the PFL attitude, skidding turn scenario. But it, it's just as easy to teach the right thing the first time. So if we take that time to just spend a few minutes thinking about what are we trying to achieve, what's the objective of this part of this flight, and we do it well, then we're going to set that student up to fish for life. Uh, and guidance and review is only part of the solution, so it's really a whole bunch of things. A couple of other things we see. Trim confusion, I think somebody mentioned trim there before. We've got various complicated variations of trimming systems in aircraft, some appear reversed. Um, road learning, I can fly these numbers, I fly to that fence, I fly to that height, I end up here at 500 feet, and if I do this right, I'll be on the runway. The repetition process becomes a, a, an ingrained habit and then they go to a different runway and we all know what happens. Turning parallax error, explaining the high side, low side scenario in the turn so the student understands the correct attitude reference again. But when you're going to get them looking at the front, make sure they understand that the front changes when you turn left or right, depending on where you're sitting. Checks and cockpit behaviour. Somebody raised this in discussion at morning tea. There's a lot of discussion in the manual that we're writing at the moment. Should we ingrain some basic checks or should we have a standard? And I think that the general consensus amongst the instructor manual panels, we shouldn't. Everybody's got different uh, check systems that they use and something unique to aircraft. But do we get them to verbalise the check as they fly the check? If it's a, yeah, who verbal who says, okay, I want to hear the check, I want to hear you say it, I want to hear that, yeah. Do you get them to say the acronym, like if it's bump fish? Do you say, okay, I want you to say bump fish, so anchor it, anchor it to that, that memory, that long-term memory, and now work through the process. So yeah, sometimes with checks, it's not about what you have, what checklist you use, which chif wap, chif wa, was, you know, whatever you might use in any of the checks, 
just make sure that they verbalise and have a good anchoring reference. Um, and that becomes important when you move to different times. Talk to your horse. I think I've just about done that power for ASB. We've covered There we go. There's a photo. Uh, working as a team. Instructors and students need to work together. It's an interactive reality relationship. They're learning from you, you're sometimes learning from them. And in fact, if you're not learning more about them than they are from you, then I might suggest that perhaps the, the, the training or the learning process is probably the wrong way around. Because we need to understand that we have to, as it's particularly recreational, we have to teach different styles for different types of students. Um, Bill mentioned the old and the young student, very much different. PMI provides our guidance. Who's read through PMI recently? Who's been around for 20 years instructing and actually just dropped their head back into a PMI book and had a look at it? I do it every day, unfortunately. <laughs> I'd encourage you to go back. Whatever reference you've used or, or find a new reference, um, I'm, I'm not always one to fire CASA, but I think CASA have got an excellent Appendix D to their CAP 514, which is about PMI. Uh, it will become the reference PMI document uh, information that's to be referenced in our instructor manual. Um, but I would encourage you to go back as instructors and teachers and go back and, and just refresh the concepts of teaching, of questioning on the ground and how we deliver training. Um, I'll just a few more points to wrap up. The instructor is our reference, he's our coach, he's the critic, he's a mentor and an advisor. So you've got a lot of hats to wear. Um, the types of, types of interaction vary with development, so again, I think that was covered and I take Andy and John's comments and Colin back them up, that we, can, we have to apply certain complex levels of training at different points in the syllabus. And consistency is the key. Everything we heard last year was that instructors and our CFIs want to see better consistency across our students. So I think focusing on these areas and sharing these things is the way to go. So better instructors create better pilots. We all must continue to learn, all of us, and our training reference manual will provide some guidance material for that. <coughs> Just a final quote from Ernest Hemingway. That's it, any questions? Uh, yeah, Mike, uh, you wanted to talk about um, spin and spin recovery. Is that right? Barry Renford and I have been uh, discussing this for more years than I care to think. Um, and this all came about mainly after I was, uh, I started my flying in 1944, and I was an instructor in 1952, and all through my military, and early GA, and. Uh, more bird and all the other things. Um, I was doing a lot of spin training and things like that and uh, in the gliding world I got four and a half hours, uh, four and a half thousand hours of gliding and competition and we spent a lot of time um, doing spin training. And I was very interested to see how spinning was taught in the, in the uh, gliding world. And we particularly, initially, we're told that the spin recovery, when we got into it, was to put full opposite rudder, um, to, um, stick fully forward. Um, the rudder was to stop the rotation and the stick fully forward to unstall the aircraft and then get out of the uh, ensuing dive. I was based at the Naval Fighter Station at Yeovilton and we were very close to um, Boston down the Empire Test Pilot School and they came over to us and uh, in 1973 they said we think that the method of recovery is right but the reasons that you give are totally wrong and uh, we taped an aircraft up and uh, this was as a result of a number of accidents in shipbucks um, where pilots were, in fact, using three notches of brake for asymmetric braking and for taxiing, going up and doing aerobatics, and particularly spinning. And uh, because they had three notches of brake, 
which effectively reduces those chipmunk pilots would know, reduces the angle of rudder that you can put on. Uh, they were becoming widow makers fairly quickly. The other thing that chipmunk did was to spin fairly flat if you left it spinning for a long time. And that effectively blanked off the rudder. And that didn't help either. So they put wooden strakes down the back end of the chipmunk. And uh, that tended to not let the chipmunk get into such a flat spin. But what we did, we taped up the wings with tape to see exactly what happened when we were doing spin training and spin recovery. And we put about a thousand tapes across both wings. We took the aircraft up to uh, these were chipmunks to start with, to 10,000 feet, got into a spin and let it go down and then we applied the correction. And the first thing we found was when we put full rudder on, the aircraft pitched forward and immediately the tapes which had been going all over the wing as a stalled um, airframe suddenly went straight but the aircraft continued turning. Then we pushed the stick fully forward right to the instrument panel and the rotation stopped. And we thought, hell, what's this? And of course we worked it all out fairly quickly that when the aircraft is actually stalled and spinning, it is a gyro going round and round horizontally, varying occasionally in pitch, up and down. And if you put full opposite rudder against the direction of turn, you're applying a force parallel with the gyro going round. The reaction is at 90 degrees. And we, I mean, it's fairly obvious. The next thing we found was we pitched forward and that unstalled the wing. The next thing was the aircraft was still rotating round, but now unstalled, and of course would be gathering speed. So putting the stick fully forward, at the same sort of time as you're putting the rudder on, if you're applying a force now, vertically down against the rotation, which the real resultant force is at 90 degrees, and that stopped the rotation. So what we were doing, teaching from that point on, 1973, was to say, okay, the procedure for recovery and spin is very simple. Full opposite rudder will unstall your wing, Full stick forward will stop your rotation and enable you then to pull out of the ensuing dive. And uh, that's what we were teaching. And I wondered if a few people had thought about it in that way and how many people do a lot of spinning and uh, whether that sort of way is the way you teach it. Can I just have a show of hands? Who actually has conducted as an instructor outside of recreational aviation, of course, spin training or any sort of spin activity? Who, yeah, keep your hands up then. Who thinks that we should make it uh, advisory that instructors who are wishing to cover as instructors undertake at least some form of spin exposure before they initiate an instructor rating? Anybody think we shouldn't have that, not a requirement, but certainly make it a recommendation? Anybody think that we shouldn't do it? No, thanks. Probably not for group B. So, <laughs> uh, yes, yes, sorry. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll restrict this uh, discussion to three axes if we can. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. <laughs> Ian. Right. Oh, just sorry, we've got John over here first, Ian. Yeah, after Mike's explanation there, I'm now totally confused with that. <laughs> What I, what I did want to uh, point out is that uh, as instructors, we tend to teach what we were taught when we learned to fly. And um, hopefully our instructors got it right at the time. But I went to a presentation at the uh, Royal Queensland Aero Club. Um, I hope I actually ran that. And we had a guy that got there and he challenged every instructor in the room and said, you have been teaching lift theory, all of you have been teaching lift theory incorrectly, in that you know, the, the wings don't suck, the Newley's theory doesn't work, the way an aeroplane wing flies is a high pressure underneath, not the suction on top. Now, it was a room similar to this, 
full of uh, some very highly experienced instructors. No one had enough guts to get up there and challenge the guy. And he had a lot of NASA uh, calculations and graphs and things. And if it did nothing else to me was to get all of us to look at the way we do teach, why do we teach the way we teach, and it's only because that's what we were taught. And so none of us actually can hold you know, all the answers. It's a matter of just what we said, we've got to learn from other people, and whether it be our students or someone else who, and, and being challenged and challenging your own ideas is always uh, is a good thing. And so I must say that's the first time I've heard that explanation of uh, spent training. Uh, as I said, then to be challenged, a lift isn't actually lift, it's high pressure under the wings. And uh, yeah, it's. I think at the end of the day, we come up with an explanation that the raw student understands. And that's what we've got to remember is whatever it takes to get that student through and at least get him flying, and then if they want to go on to aerodynamics afterwards and get, get into the Navy test uh, pilot's manual, <laughs> then they're welcome to it. But um, you know, it's it really. We're going to get them flying and keeping them safe as pilots. How we all do it, we all do it differently. And we all find that different things work for different people. So, so I don't think, um, you know, you, you can ever say to one guy, oh, no, that's wrong, or this is what you should be doing. And, uh, and, I, and I must say, I still don't know whether the wings suck or... <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, John. Look, um, one, more, one more with Ian, and then we'll wrap the session up, guys. So I'll just let Ian, I think, want to talk but look, John, thank you. I think you just embraced and just articulated very nicely what this whole segment was about. It was about sharing tricks of the trade, testing ideas, challenging some ideas, and thanks, uh, Ian. I'll let you finish off for Thanks, Neil. Just very quickly, and perhaps a few more tricks of the trade than anything else, but with a gliding background, I think it's not vitally important for spin training is not teaching recovery, but teaching the consequences of what happens in a spin and particularly turning on to the final approach, getting low and slow into that final turn, and to demonstrate at height, and it's easy in the globe because you can work quite easily, that in an uncontrolled environment over which you're not quite sure what's happening, and you, and you get low and slow, uh, and you get high into the um, bank and get the nose high, etc., etc., and you put it into a spin, and you don't know what to do, it'll take 500 feet to recover. If you're turning base at 490 feet, you're dead. So I think it's very important that we teach the consequences of spinning as well as getting into and out of the spin. And I think what you've hit on is also scenarios. When we look at, let's look at scenarios that are real. Um, we can spin all day, we can go down that path if we wanted to, if we had the right aircraft. But are we really, are we really sharpening the sword? Let's teach them the scenarios that thousands and thousands of pilots have got themselves into. They're not going to be new ways. So, thank you. Thanks very much, guys. I appreciate it. Thanks for all your input and uh, feedback. Thank you. I, uh, I'd like to particularly thank Neil for that because it takes a certain amount of determination, belief and strength of will to stand up in front of 60 plus CFIs and talk about that sort of stuff. So. Not that you guys are intimidating or anything, but um, it is a possibility for, uh, you know, could have a certain amount of confidence to do that. Very happy for uh, that Neil did such a good job. Thank him again. He's put a lot of effort into that. I'll get myself plugged in here in a second. Okay, he stole my thunder, because I was going to talk about that. But we'll talk about that a little bit more. What I want to talk about now is just giving you some response to that feedback that you gave us yesterday, which was really valuable. And again, I'd like to thank Paul McEwen for facilitating that for us and, and Kelvin for being his microphone runner. Um, that was really valuable for us. We've taken that information on board and uh, I'm just going to talk through very briefly about some of that now. We're not going to come up with all the answers now, but we're at least going to have a bit of a discussion about it. So, inflexibility of ops manual issue seven. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> um, converting applicants, requirements, usability and readability. It's never going to be a perfect document. We're going to continue to work to get that document better. And part of that process is going to be a review consultation process uh, early next year to make amendments to the ops manual. I agree, I want to, I've got a grand vision for a, a plain English document. And I, th I think we should be aiming towards that. We don't have to go by the 
the legalistic way of, of writing documentation. And I, I'm going to put out a few ideas out there and get some feedback from you guys, so um, be prepared for some of that early next year. Uh, and the converting applicant uh, requirements, I, I take that on board. I have got uh, a bit of a flip side uh, point of view on that. Um, again, because Neil and I get to do a lot of the conversions of these grade three instructors, it's, uh, it's often the case that they are absolutely perfect when it comes to delivering the, the theory. They've got the whiteboard briefing down perfectly, but when they come to actually doing the hands-on skills, they're not actually up to speed. And someone do, some, do two quite alarming manoeuvres to me in a fox bat just recently, and they were a brand new 150-hour CPL grade three, uh, and they did not handle that aircraft properly. If I let it go, they would have damaged the nose wheel, and we're seeing a lot of accidents, nose wheel accidents, mishandling, where the instructor's not catching the aircraft, the student's putting them in a position that they, they shouldn't be, be allowed to do. So we'll have a, a bit more of a robust discussion about that. I'll take your point. Um, plain English. Separating, as I talked before, separating PPC and three axis uh, from being so intermingled in the ops manual. Because at the moment, we're trying to make the document do lots of things. Uh, we're trying to say, if you've got this experience, we'll accept this, we'll take it across to here. It makes it very complicated. So we'll extract all that out and make it a whole lot easier to read and then that way if you're not interested in PPC you just don't go near those pages and the PPC instructors don't go anywhere near the three axis stuff. It's going to take a little bit of work. Um, uh, next one is... School inspections. Uh, yes, there's certainly always room for improvement along those, those areas. Exit meetings was a, a question, and uh, it was our understanding as ops that we, we did that, but perhaps we haven't done that for everyone, and perhaps we need to ensure that ROCs and people who are delegated to do those inspections do provide an exit meeting. The uh, guidance for requirements, uh, again, I hope we're not coming across as too inflexible. We don't really mind how you record landings or fuel as long as you do it. It doesn't have to be done our way, but there are ATSB requirements and tech manual requirements for those things. So they shouldn't be coming to you as a surprise. But we can certainly provide more, uh, more information to you about that. One of the ideas I'm coming up with or playing with at the moment is a possibility of a documentary compliance remotely for the schools because a lot of what we do when we're sitting there at the school is saying, do you have this tick? Do you have this tick? We're going to get the CFIs to self self-certify and self-assess that that element or those elements. We're also going to uh, have the facility for you to be able to upload uh, example student records, maintenance records, daily flight logs, etc. And we can do desktop audits remotely. So uh, I've talked to a couple of you about that. I've got a couple of people out there trying, trialling my first draft of a self-assessment form. Now that doesn't mean you're going to be out in the wilderness because one of the key things that an ops man, uh, sorry, a uh, school inspection does is provides the opportunity for CFIs and ops to talk. What I'd really like to do is bring that back to a professional development session in a region. So we might go to central Queensland or north Queensland or south Queensland or any of the regional areas and we might say OPS is going to be here for these two days, bring along instructors, CFIs, let's have two day professional development, let's talk about specific briefings, let's get people up and, and do a brief and critique, not to be judgmental but just simply to become more mature as instructors. Uh, and I think that will possibly have more benefit. It certainly means that Neil and I won't have to repeat sometimes the same message 172 times. I won't be able to do it maybe uh, 15 or 20 times. And it also means that you will get the benefit of mentoring and, and working with your local CFIs who are not your competitors. They are actually your um, mentors, your people to work with, your allies. Does that sound like a reasonable sort of concept? Any feedback, any suggestions straight away that I can leap on? <coughs> Great, love it. Okay, CTA endorsement, hell yes, that's a priority for us. <laughs> We're working our way through the processes right now. Unfortunately, it is not a simple process. Um, anyone give me an idea of what they, what they think the, the key points will be for our CTA endorsement? What are the, some of the key triggers that we're going to have to have? Isn't Hang on, Bruce. Is Hang on. Isn't CASA going to require a medical, no matter what we do, CASA are not going to give it to us without a medical? I'm going to try the safety case based on uh, what's going on in the US at the moment with the pilot bill, talking about the, the self-declared medical standard. So I'm going to try to not go down that path. So it's certainly my first approach. Yep, what else, what other requirements have we got? Transponder and radio. <coughs> transponder and radio, absolutely. What do we need for transponder and radio? 
Yeah, yeah calibration. 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 Yep, absolutely. Who's doing calibrations now? Who's got ideas? <laughs> and uh, if anyone's not doing calibrations, why not? Where's your requirement? You've got the CIO 100.5, but you've also got tech manual requirements. So in order for us to be helping you, you need to help us by complying with those sorts of requirements and being aware of those requirements. The other uh, point that Neil just made is mode is transponders. So uh, don't buy mode C's, upgrade. Uh, when you buy a new aircraft, make sure it's mode S. What other requirements? So, I'm assuming like, well for us, it's got to be certified aircraft, certified engine. Um, yeah, you've got to have medical, you've got to have radio exams, pre-solo exams for that type of airspace. You've got to do the CASAMOS 61 CTA, CTIR components. So. Yep. What about as an organisation? What do I need to do? I need to make sure you guys can teach it. With all due respect. <laughs> and it's aimed at me. I've got a PPL with CTA approval. I haven't gone near CTA for years. Not that I'm scared, I just don't have a need in tomorrow. There's no CTA anywhere near me. So I've got to go back to school and I've got to brush up my skills. Some of you guys operate near CTA or in CTA. That's excellent. We've got 172 CFIs and we've got 446 instructors in total. So we're going to have to make sure all of those people know how to teach, what to teach, uh, and give them appropriate training. So there's actually a whole lot of organisational issues before we push the button to go to CASA and say, hey, can we have CTA? Now the best part is, as I think, I can't remember if we spoke about this already, but the DAS has already shown quite a lot of favour towards this. So there's not going to be a lot of opposition to CASA if we get our house in order. So yep, totally agree. Uh, you'll see the point there says heritage and innovation. I had that discussion with someone else today. Um, we've got, we've got a, a rapidly evolving fleet of aircraft. Excuse me, aircraft. We've got a rapidly evolving amount of materials and technology and all sorts of amazing stuff available to us. Still got to remember we've got heritage aircraft out there and people that just want to fly around in their local area, don't want to go above a thousand feet because they get scared, they don't want to use radios. So there is a proposal for an ultralight pilot certificate. The board has approved that in principle. All I've got to do is have time to write it up. It's really almost a marketing exercise in some respects because all of those requirements are not necessarily applicable for all operations. So we've got to balance that spread of operations. We've gone from a very professional, or going towards a very professional DA end of, of, of the world, and we want all those lovely privileges. We also have to remember we've got the, uh, the ultralight, genuine ultralights out there that we still need to support, people flying in drifters and thrusters and those sorts of aircraft. Uh, advocacy of Jabiru issues. Well, I was going to get Michael and Mick to talk about that. Mick, you want to pop up and give a bit of a, a summary of the adv advocacy we've been doing. It's uh, probably better coming from the President than me. Thank you. Uh, look, I've been put on the spot here, Sorry. thanks Phil. No, I've got good. nothing prepared, but what I will say is um, just a, a brief recap of history. Late last year, uh, Michael and I found ourselves put on the spot with a, a CASA instrument dumped in our lap, and we were actually on a flight from uh, Sydney back to Canberra. We were just as bought out as you guys, and uh, I think a lot of you guys would have been at the CFI conference that preceded that night coming out. And uh, and and quite frankly, we were we were appalled at the, the way that CASA handled that. Uh, we made very strong noises. Uh, more so about the way that the issue was handled rather than the, uh, the action that was taken. I'll leave it up to you guys to judge whether that action was, uh, was appropriate or not. But we've worked very closely with CASA since then, <coughs> and, uh, and to CASA's credit, they've been very, very consultative uh, over the, the, uh, the following months. Uh, they've involved us, they've involved AOPA, they've involved the SAAA, uh, and a bunch of other stakeholders. Uh, Jill spent quite a considerable amount of time um, putting up some uh, alternative restrictions uh, that we thought would be more appropriate for our operators. And, uh, and over time, uh, some conditions have been slightly relaxed, although perhaps not as much as we'd all like them to. Um, but, um, but we have made some progress there. In terms of the, the engineering difficulties, RAOS does not have uh, the time, the money, the people, the resources, uh, or anything of the like 
to dedicate towards that. Um, so unfortunately, that, that's an issue where Jabiru has to satisfy CASA that they've made the appropriate steps in the right direction um, before that's lifted. But we have been notified that uh, Jabiru's made significant progress, um, although given that the, the issue is between Jabiru and CASA, we, we don't have a lot of detail there. But, um, but we are hopeful that that, that will be um, lifted or at least relax uh, sometime in the near future. We've made numerous uh, suggestions to CASA about how that instrument should apply to us, um, its relation to, or in, in comparison to experimental aircraft. There are some restrictions in there that are more onerous than, um, than what you might find in an experimental aircraft with, say, a VW or a Subaru engine, and we don't think that's appropriate. Um, but we are working with, with CASA on that issue. Um, I think it's worth saying also, while we're talking about CASA, we've, we've worked very closely with them, uh, certainly since I've, I've taken on my role uh, on the board. And, uh, and we've strengthened our ties, and, and we've worked very closely since Mark Skidmore has come in, and I'm sure you've already his, his 10 point philosophy, uh, which he's recently released. I think it's only in the last few weeks, maybe two months. But um, I, I strongly believe that, that CASA is going through a change. I think it's a positive change. Um, I think the proof is in the pudding. We're, we're yet to really see the results, but, uh, but I think internally there, there are uh, definitely some changes on the way, and I hope that uh, really changes the way that, that issues like the Jabiru issue are dealt with in the future. But look, in, in short, uh, we've, we've spoken to Jabiru, we've spoken to CASA, we've spoken to many affected parties and, and other organisations, and, uh, and we do think Jabiru are making some progress to, to having those restrictions lifted by addressing some of the underlying engineering issues. Is there any questions? Yeah, we've got one over here. <coughs> Yeah, hi Mike. Uh, I mean, I fly a couple of Jabiru's at my school, so I'm, I'm very happy to accept whatever's coming out here. We've got problems with planes, we sort it. Um, and I'm very, I've always had some concerns, and I won't hear those here. But um, one of the things I'd like to ask you, given that I was told uh, that out of two thirds of the RAA schools have got Jabiru planes in them, I feel there was a real <clears throat> practical contingency for the RAA because let's just run a scenario that Jabiru get grounded. In effect, you may be pretty much grounding a lot of the RAA. So I would like to sort of hear your response to that or if you even thought along those lines. Yeah, look, I'd like to broaden it beyond that. Um, to me, the SC Cash is meant to safety. Um, and, and some of the measures that they put in place, I, I don't see the direct link between the measure and the, and the safety outcome. In this case, one of my original concerns was uh, not, not so much around that issue that you've just outlined, although that was a very... I think you've got to accept that they're very... I don't want to sort of go that way. I think you get to accept that they've made a ruling. I think we need to accept that they've made a ruling, because in the past, when I was in the RAA earlier, all you know, often read it in the magazines that they're arguing with CASA. Let's forget that. The real issue is if there's an issue there with the planes of Jabiru, they've responded, I accept that. Uh, and I think we just, for our future in the RAA, we need to look at that practical contingency that hangs over our head. For a lot of years, I did a lot of strategic consulting overseas, and if I was advising the RAA, you know, as a consultant, I'd say you've got a, an, an issue there that you need to look at. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and For the future, we've, all right. We've, we've spoken with Jabber about those issues and, and we've actually um, you know, tried to work with them to address some of those issues and, and help get the word out uh, how to prevent these issues arising with the, the pilots in the future. But what I was going to say before was, to me, one of the issues is uh, if Jabber suffers to the point that they fail, where does that leave pilots and operators of their aircraft then? Um, so, sorry? Where does that leave RAA? Yeah, it, exactly. So it's certainly a, an issue that we're aware well, of. My question is to you as a CEO. You know, uh, for the, I just want to correct on that. To you, the President and the CEO, it doesn't matter. Uh, I think you get the drift. My question to you is what has the RAA done, RAA done uh, to ensure its future and, and that, that it will be viable if that does happen? Well, look, I, I think we, we have to keep in mind that this. Uh, around about 3,500 aircraft in the fleet. And while it is a substantial number, um, it's 
it's still only one third, and we've got to respect the, the interests of, of those other members. There's, there's two thirds of our members that aren't affected by this. Um, so it, it will hurt, there's no kidding. It, it will hurt if, if Jabiru were to fail. Um, that said, we've got other aircraft where the, the manufacturer no longer exists, and we have found ways around it. I think that's one of the wonderful things about our sector of aviation, is that we are creative, we are innovative. Um, it will definitely hurt the, the flying training sector, of course. Um, but I think as an organisation, we, we would still be here tomorrow. But I take your point, it would definitely hurt us. I think there was another question up the back somewhere, just before. Um, no, but Ed, Ed Smith. Yeah. Just up the front. I thought I saw a hand in the back. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, one, one solution that would probably work with the, you know, the Jabiru fleet would be now going to um, seek um, advice from the suited to qualify people to see whether or not alternative engines could in fact be fitted to Jabiru aircraft if we wind up with a, a legacy fleet of Jabiru's and no engine manufacturer. I mean, that would be an obvious solution. There are Jabiru's out there that do in fact have Rotax engines in them that have been signed off by the appropriate authority. Um, there are those sorts of solutions available if the worst comes to the worst, I would hope. We've done it with poly propellers on skyboxes and things where you can't get the, the original wooden propeller anymore. I think an obvious backup position is to, to see if we can find an agreement to allow um, an alternative motor to be fitted in the, in the, in the aircraft concern. Yeah, look, I mean, there's... Um, there's, there's definitely alternative engines out there, the obvious one being Camet. The, the problem we face here is, uh, you mentioned the bolly prop and the, um, the, the issue with getting the, the original replacement, uh, it's no longer manufactured, and in fact the aircraft manufacturer no longer exists in that case as well. The, the big difference there is, um, A, the aircraft manufacturer doesn't exist and we haven't had that situation arise yet in the LSA space, but B, uh, they weren't LSA aircraft and the rules, um, which are outside of the control of RAOs, except to the extent that we advocate and lobby, um, but the rules state that the only person who can approve uh, a, a, a modification to those aircraft are the LSA manufacturer. Now, if Jabiru were to fold, and, and I sincerely hope they don't. Um, I think we would definitely find ourselves in a situation where we would look at uh, talking to CASA and, and making some sort of process like that available. But as the rules stand today, uh, the vast majority of those Jabirus that are out there are LSA, and, and we have no alternative but to, um, to have their engines in them. Type certified and experimental, sure, there's avenues. But neither of those, well, actually type certified can be used in training, but the experimental can't. So that's not going to solve the problem brought up before about the flying schools. Is there anything else? I'll give it back to you. Sorry for putting you on the spot. Okay. Uh, there was another point brought up by another CFI about uh, slight onerous requirement, well, not slight, onerous requirement for uh, the student having to be deemed competent in emergencies prior to being sent solo. So I've taken that note as an action item for when we talk to CASA next about the instrument. Yep, the critical need for insurance for instructors, L2s and schools. I think I'll put the uh, CEO on the spot for this one. Michael. I've spoken to a couple of you about insurance and we actually spoke to our insurers last week. Um, we're rolling out products and the L2 um, insurance and insurance for schools as a whole, as a whole, H-O-L-E, not H-U-L-L, -L, as W-H-O-L-E actually, as a whole, um, is something that we're currently talking to the insurance company Willis about. We're about to roll out um, accident and life insurance for pilots. So. When you fly, the current policy now as a member, your third party property damage is covered to $20 million, the passenger is covered to $250,000, and 
and unless the pilot's taken out his or her own insurance, there's no coverage for the pilot. Now, in a lot of cases, you're dead so you don't care. Um, but in a lot of cases, as we've been finding, there's more and more accidents where people are getting injuries. Well, not more and more, but there are accidents where people are getting injured. So we wanted to get some coverage for pilots. Um, that's going to roll out in the next couple of months. And then the, the products after that are the L2 coverage, professional indemnity insurance for L2s. Um, and then we're looking at overarching school insurance. Um, then you come to the question of cost. Who should pay that? If we insure 170 schools and it costs 200 grand a year, RALs is not going to have the funds to pay for that. Um, it's going to be as we do with our members insurance, which is a $400,000 bill a year. That's folded into members um, registration fees, annual membership fees. And we look at doing something like that. But I think if we go to our brokers with 170 schools uh, in our kit bag, we'll be able to negotiate very competitive prices and, and better prices than schools could individually negotiate themselves. So it's high on my radar. Insurance is one of my big ticket items, um, one of the big key things in our strategic plan and in our focus over the next um, few months. And we'll keep you guys updated through the website, through communications and stuff like that. But they're definitely on the radar, Jill. Just with regard to the schools, Michael, are you going to um, allow for consultation with all of us, the schools, before you, you come to us possibly and say, you're paying, you go and negotiate? Yes. Okay. Michael, I'm just taking on uh, the HGV again, and uh, I became a member with him just recently, once again, uh, probably even many years ago, uh, I've had a membership, so it was a normal cost, a couple hundred dollars, and then I've had to pay insurance sometimes that because I'm a C5. Uh, so it's over eleven hundred dollars I've got to pay every year just to be a member of, or just to be a C5 in the HGFA. It, and I, at the moment, I don't see any benefit. I'm still waiting on the membership card. I haven't received anything from them except an endorsement I shouldn't have. I'm not a guy to take part in what have been, but they offered to me. They said, oh, you've got one, no, this one, I like this one. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, I'll get the HDFA on the phone. Um, I can't answer that for you. Um, we're hoping the insurance won't be $1,100. I have no idea what the cost is going to be. It's not even a conversation I had with the insurers um, at this stage, but as Kelvin said, it's about negotiating and coming to you guys. What do you want? What, what in the basket of insurance products, what do you guys want? Where, where do you need coverage? What's the type of coverage? What's it look like um, to you? And that's a conversation for us to have over the next few months. Thanks, Michael. I love it when I can hand over those tricky ones to someone else. Okay. Okay, online membership applications is done. Jared's going to talk about that. But we're on accord in accord with that one. Uh, no net differences between RPL and RL's privileges? Yes, absolutely, that's what we're pursuing. Uh, increasing max takeoff weight, CTA, there's a number of proposals there which are intended to make sure there's a parallel path. And the, and the director again said he's very keen on having the clear parallel path between RALs and, and CASA. So we're all on the same page there. Uh, survey, well, one of the things that you guys came up with, uh, which was really good information for us, is the uh, number of schools here in the room who uh, rely on the, the school as the sole source of their income. So one of the things I'm sure Michael will be looking at uh, in the next few months will be some survey, surveying of, of owners of schools and CFIs. So when you see that survey come out, please participate, because the fuller the information we get, the better understanding we have of what the school's about. That'll include questions about ownership, structure, income, and other things that Michael wants to talk about. No? Uh, and Michael's going to talk a whole lot more about that in his marketing presentation tomorrow. So again, we're in accord. Uh, responsibility for airworthiness was a really interesting one, and it wasn't something that had crossed my radar particularly, but uh, at discussions with staff last night, even though we said we weren't going to talk business, we did. Um, the tech department and ops need to get together to talk about that. We need to go back to you guys and get some more clarification, but it's certainly a point we've taken as an action item. And 
the minimum age, no minimum age for candidates, ironically, we were talking about that with the board on Sunday. The direction came from the board previously, quite a few years ago, different iteration of board members, presidents, etc. And uh, it was something that we were given a direction to investigate and remove. So again, we're in accord. And financial viability and anxiety about the future. Well, who's not anxious about the future? What is that stock market doing? Um, but uh, again, Michael will be giving you some strategies tomorrow and he'll be delivering uh, some information to you about that tomorrow. So, I do thank you for the feedback and don't believe that we're not committed to the issues. Um, it's not the bad old days where we say, yep, thanks for that, see you later, and don't even think about it. I've got notes written down there. You will see some action on those items. I just can't promise they're all going to get delivered in the next couple of months because we've got lots of competing priorities. We've been running around, as Michael says, at V&E for a little while. We need to throttle back a little bit, get some runs on the board with some other areas, operate at V&O for a while. So I was going to talk a little bit more about um, instructor uh, raising the bar for the instructors, but I think we're getting to lunch, and I think the natives are getting restless. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. Anyone wants a lunch break? All right, let's go for a lunch break, and we'll come back in half an hour, 1.30. Thanks for your time. Thanks for your input. See you in half an hour.